Hello and welcome. My name is Zach Hackworth. I'm a forester with the UK Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and a member of the UK Maple Research Team. And we are excited to offer this tutorial video for those interested in, our, in participating in our beginner maple producer study. This project is really a unique opportunity to accomplish several tasks in growing Kentucky's maple syrup industry. And we thank each one of you for your interest and cooperation in being a part of it. To get things started, I want to provide some background on the project. And then we will jump into all the exciting parts of talking about tapping trees and gathering sap. All the things that will help you be well on your way to becoming a full-fledged maple producer. In late summer, the UK Research Foundation which comprises folks from UK, the Kentucky Maple Syrup Association, and various other organizations, was awarded a large grant from the US Department of Agriculture to help grow the state's maple syrup industry. Now, historically, maple syrup in Kentucky has really been produced on just a hobbyist or recreational level, but it's really started to take off in the last five to 10 years as the statewide production of maple syrup is up. So we were really excited to obtain this grant. To help promote and advance the industry, we devised a series of goals, all of which fall into one of three broad categories. The first goal is to increase the number of producers in the state and thereby increase the volume of syrup being produced. Two, in keeping with the idea of growing the volume of syrup, in the state was the idea of supporting our current producers and helping them to get their brand and their products out to a larger clientele. And finally, the third goal was to collect data on forest and climate factors that influence sap production in Kentucky, where very little official data is available on these parameters. So by collecting this data, we will be able to create a set of best management guidelines to assist new and current producers in setting up and maintaining sustainable sugaring operations. So to help us accomplish two of these goals, we devised the Beginner Maple Producer Study. This study seeks to engage brand new producers in syrup production, while at the same time gathering research data for developing best management guidelines. The incentive for participants to join was the majority of startup costs for SAP collection would be covered by the grant in the form of supply kits provided to those study participants in exchange for cooperation in data collection. So first we put out a survey to gauge interest to see who might be interested in working with us on the project. And we were just blown away by the number of responses that we got to that survey because from that survey, we received 37 responses of people who were interested in working with us. However, unfortunately, we were only able to provide supply kits to 18 producers. However, I do want to stress that if you did not receive a supply kit, I would encourage you to participate with us anyway. If you're interested in syrup production and in participating, you can check out our equipment lists that are provided with the video. The startup cost for, for purchasing all of these required materials that you'll see is only around $100. So if you plan to purchase the equipment and would like to participate, send us an email and let us know. We're more than happy to work with as many new producers as we can, and we will get you data sheets and we pro will provide you all the support that we can in completing the study. So that brings us up to speed on how we got to this point. The remainder of this video discusses in detail all the steps that you'll need to take to get started collecting SAP. This will include compiling materials, selecting the best trees, tapping the trees, setting up collection systems, and then finally recording SAP measurements that will enable us to calculate SAP volumes. Now this video is very heavily detail oriented with both text descriptions and video demonstrations. 
So please review each segment thoroughly before going to the next one, because it's crucial that you fully understand each part to be successful on this project. So let's begin. Successful maple syrup production begins with collection of tree sap. And knowing the properties of sap and how it's produced will allow you to be efficient in your collection of it. Maple sap is collected from maple trees and is in turn boiled down to increase the sugar content to create syrup. But what exactly is sap? Sap is a clear liquid that is created inside of the tree. It is approximately 95 to 98% water and about 2 to 5% concentrations of various other sugar molecules. Within the tree, sap is used predominantly as the method of translocating water and nutrients to various parts of the tree to aid it in growth and various other plant processes. So sap is effectively a heavily diluted solution of sugar water. For reference, finished maple syrup has a sugar content of around 68 to 70 percent. So this is where the boiling process comes into play. By boiling off the excess water, we are slowly, and sometimes very slowly, increasing the sugar content of the mixture until it reaches the consistency of syrup. So we know that sap is a dilution, but what we're interested in is collecting the sap. So when is sap produced in the tree, and more importantly, when can it be collected? Sap is produced year-round in the tree from the taking up of water in through the roots, but co conditions for collecting sap are only right during the dormant season or winter when all the leaves have fallen from the trees. In Kentucky, optimal times for tapping maple trees is between approximately December and March. But why is that approximate? Well, sap collection and production is climate and temperature dependent. To understand this fully, we need to learn some new terminology. Maple producers and researchers refer to the time when sap is flowing during the dormant season as a run. Now, if you hang out around a group of experienced producers, you'll likely hear terms like a run day, or you'll hear descriptions of how many runs a producer had during the last season, or maybe even if it was a bad run year. During a run, is when we want to ensure that we have our taps installed and our buckets ready to collect sap. But how do we know when runs will occur? Runs occur during periods of freezing and thawing. The statement that's most often heard when describing the timing of a run is that it occurs on days when it was below freezing the night before and above freezing during the day. So what's happening inside of the tree during this freeze-thaw cycle? When temperatures, <clears throat> excuse me, when temperatures are below freezing, pressure inside the tree draws water upward in the tree. After the temperatures warm to above freezing, the sap inside of the tree flows downward. And if your taps are in place, the sap will flow through the tap into your bucket. So part of being a good maple producer is keeping track of the weather and the temperature. If temperatures are hovering near 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you can be certain a run is probably near. But it should be noted that both the freeze and the thaw are needed for the run. If temperatures are consistently below freezing, let's say 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit, or above freezing, around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, Runs are unlikely to occur. This is why there's so much variability in sap production from year to year. During unseasonable winters, where temperatures are either very cold or very warm, sap production can be drastically reduced. 
This is one of the reasons why it's so hard to predict sap production patterns. But in Kentucky, you can expect typically one to two good runs every season with a pretty good confidence. So now that we know that sap production begins at the tree and that it's dependent on the weather, what else influences sap? Well, certain tree characteristics influence production with tree species being one of the most important ones. For this project, we're working with maple trees, but within maple trees, there is a hierarchy. Sugar maples are considered the top producing tree for syrup or sugar production, hence its name. In the northern latitudes, these trees are typically the sole species used for syrup, but in Kentucky, Sugar maple is not as common and red maple is much more common. But although red maple is more common, it tends to produce lower volumes of sap and has a lower sugar content than sugar maple. Just to note though, you can tap any species of maple for sap. Sugar maple and red maple are certainly prized for syrup production but you can also tap silver maples, black maples, and box elders. But the quality of sap from these species is much poorer compared to sugar and even red maple. So for the purpose of this study, we'll ask that you stick to sugar and red maple. Sap production is probably most dependent on tree size. As may be expected, larger trees produce greater volumes of sap. In forestry, especially when dealing with syrup production, we often look at a tree's diameter and the size and quality of its crown when selecting trees to tap. And finally, in addition to these factors, we will also want to look at the overall health of the tree before tapping it. Sap flows through the wood, so if there are any injuries to the tree, or there are signs of rot or overall decline in the tree, chances are that that tree won't produce good sap and it should likely be avoided. So not only do tree characteristics influence sap, but so does the location and the growing environment of the tree. If we think of an example of a vegetable garden, Better quality soils with high organic matter that are well watered will produce a greater yield. This idea is very similar for sap. Soil conditions, terrain, and a host of other variables factor into the amount of, of quality of sap produced for a particular tree, in addition to the size of the tree and the temperatures for a particular set of days. So you can see that many factors interact in the production of sap. This is why we need further study to try to parse out these trends into concrete recommendations that we can give to our producers. And that's what we're hoping that you can help us with. We have participants from all regions across Kentucky representing different soil types, different terrain types, and different forest types. By looking at all these factors, we're excited and hopeful to derive some useful information to help explain some of the trends that we're seeing in sap production. So now that we've had a small crash course, if you will, in sap production, let's discuss getting started with tapping. The first step is to get a good plan together which starts with designing a collection system. The question of what collection system is right differs for everyone. For a beginner, we recommend a closed system, gravity-driven collection system, which effectively entails a tap and a lidded bucket connected by a tube. This system keeps your staff free of contaminants and is relatively simple and affordable to deploy. For tapping, you'll just need a cordless drill and a bit and a small mallet. And for the collection system, just a spout, tube, and container with lid. So this is the type of collection system that we've designed for use with this study. 
So now let's take a look at the equipment inventory that you'll need to get started for the project. So let's discuss what materials and equipment you will need to participate in this study. Now if you were one of the 18 folks who applied and were selected to receive a supply kit, some of this equipment will be provided for you and some of it you will need to supply yourself. If you are not one of the 18 folks selected, we still encourage you to work with us. Reach out um, to us and let us know that you're interested and we're, we'd be more than happy to help you get started. Um, but again, we can only supply a limited number of kits to folks. So if you are not one of the 18 to receive a kit, you will need to purchase and compile all the equipment that you see in front of me. We've provided equipment lists along with the tutorial video so that you know exactly what to get and in what quantity. Um, we've also supplied the vendors that we use um, to acquire this material. Now we don't advocate for any of these vendors, um, but um, it's often a comfort to folks to have the same um, equipment and materials um, when starting up a new project. So we have made that available also. So for the folks who received a supply kit, let's discuss what you'll find in that kit. So first you will find 10 white five gallon buckets, um, each with a lid, and these buckets are food safe. You'll also find 10 tap and tubing drops. The tubing drop um, consists of a white plastic 5 16 inch tap, um, which has been pre-inserted into an approximately 36 inch length of 5 16 inch tubing. All of that again is food safe. You also find a 5 16 inch drill bit that you'll use to drill your tap holes in the tree. You'll find a roll of flagging. Now the flagging will be in various colors, but the flagging is important to help you identify and easily see your trees in the field. It's also what you would use to write the unique identifying number on each tree. Next, you will find a bucket opener. The bucket opener might seem like a little thing, but on cold days, these bucket lids get very rigid and hard to open. And on cold days, our fingers typically don't want to work either. So um, the, the bucket opener is going to be a lifesaver, and it will help uh, preserve your fingers on those cold days. Next, you will find a tape measure. And you might be asking yourself, why did they send me a tape measure? I've got 10 in the garage already. But the specific tape measure that we send is an English and a metric tape measure. And for this study, we're going to be working in metric. So we want to make sure that everyone has access to a metric tape measure. So that's included. Lastly, you will find an envelope included in the supply kit. Inside of the envelope, you will find the data sheets. These data sheets are what you will use to record um, the various measurements that you will take when you go to collect sap from each bucket. And it's on those data sheets um, that you'll record the data. Okay, the envelope, the envelope is a postage paid self-addressed envelope back to us. And at the end of the maple season, you will pop your completed data sheets into that envelope, seal it up, and then stick that back in the mail to us. And we'll take it from there with the data analysis and um, hopefully very shortly by the summer when we come to visit you on your farm to take tree measurements, we will be able to provide you estimates of um, how much sap was collected from each of your trees. Okay, so that um, is all of the, the supplies that you will find inside of the supply kits. Okay, so what will you have to provide? So first you will have to provide some type of cordless battery drill. Okay, a variable speed drill um, works fine, most construction grades. Um, if you're on a, if you're using a smaller drill, um, that might not work too well, um, but anything um, of this standard size that you see will work fine. Um, if you're into nostalgic maple syrup production, then you can use um, a hand brace and bit 
to drill the tap holes, that also works fine. You will also need some type of bit to drill holes for the end of the tube drops to go into the buckets. Um, what you see here is a step down bit. That's what I like to drill um, the holes in the buckets with. Um, the plastic um, is relatively um, soft on these buckets and the step down bit works very well for that. Um, a half inch drill bit, if you want to use a fixed width bit, um, is about the maximum size that we, you will need because we don't want those holes to be too big. All right, so now uh, after that you will need some type of hammer or small mallet to tap in um, the spout into the tap hole after it's been drilled. You'll need a clipboard of some type for your data sheets. Um, this type of clipboard is uh, what I recommend. It has um, a compartment on the inside of it. It opens up so you can stick your data sheets inside of that um, when you're transporting them in the woods. That just keeps them out of the elements, keeps them clean, keeps them dry, um, and preserves the data integrity, which is um, very important for this study. You can also carry in there your pencils and your Sharpie. Okay, so your Sharpie, you'll need to compile that. That's what you'll use to record um, the individual tree numbers um, on the flagging. Okay, then you will need to, to gather a 31 inch piece of rope or cord or string or yarn will even work. Okay, the, the um, string is what we will use to determine if a particular tree is large enough to be tapped or not. Okay, and it's very important that the length of that string is pretty much exactly 31 inches. Okay, and then lastly, you will need some type of pry bar. At the end of the season, you will need to remove the taps from the trees so that the tree can close up the tap hole. This particular bar is um, a bar that's specifically designed to pull taps from trees. You don't need to go out and buy this one unless you want to. Um, a, a regular flat pry bar will work fine or um, even a claw hammer um, with a straight claw will work in a pinch. Okay, the, what you don't see in front of me is um, at the end of the season, you'll um, need to compile just some household bleach cleaner um, to sanitize the buckets. All right, so that concludes all of the materials that you will need to participate in the study. So now that we know what items we'll need, let's talk about actually getting started. So before we go afield, there's actually a few quick preliminary tasks that'll need to be completed first. The first thing that you'll need to do is you'll need to drill a hole in each of your buckets to insert the tubing. The best place to drill this hole is in the side of the bucket near the top edge, as you can see in the image. By drilling in the side of the bucket, you can keep out the rain that would otherwise dilute and contaminate your sap if you were to drill a hole in the lid. The hole should be just large enough to accommodate the tubing. A close, snug fit is preferable. I like to use a step down bit for drilling this hole, but a drill bit no larger than a half inch can also be used. So, after you drill the holes in each of your buckets, you should rinse out the insides of your buckets and also the insides of your tap tube drops just to make sure that any residual plastic particles that may still be there um, will be eliminated and that your sap um, will be good and clean when you go to collect it. Lastly, you'll need to remove the ring tab from the lids. As you see in the bottom picture, the tab is sticking out and there is a small arrow that indicates which direction that the tab should be removed in. Removing the tab just ensures that you can take the lid on and off um, more easily. So then finally, after you've done those tasks, it's time to compile all of your installation materials. I like to use a separate five gallon bucket to keep all of my items in one place. So in your equipment bucket, you'll need your drill, 
your 5 16 tapping bit, your hammer, your flagging, Sharpie, and that 31 inch length of rope that we had you compile. You also may need to make sure that you gather your tap tube drops and your buckets and lids. So after you've done all of those tasks, it's time to put on your winter coat and your toboggan and lace up your boots because it's time to get started tapping. So now that we're afield with drill in hand, what's our first step? What's our first move? First, you will need to identify 10 maples of adequate size or tapping. Again, for this project and for beginner producers, we're focusing on just sugar maples and red maples as they are the best and most abundant sugar trees in Kentucky. Admittedly, this can be a very challenging task if you're not familiar with identifying trees. We've included some links to some videos that shows the identifying characteristics of sugar and red maples, but there are also many, many more online resources for tree identification. There are um, various online sources and videos, various books on tree identification. But in all of these, regardless of the method that you use, you will need to focus on the identifying characteristics for winter identification. And that is mostly identifying trees by their bark. As this is occurring during the winter and all of the leaves have fallen to the ground by the time maple tapping season comes around. However, it is possible that you could look around on the ground for maple leaves to help with identification of a tree. So after you positively identify a maple, the next question should be, is this tree large enough to be tapped? There is a threshold for tapping of trees, and that threshold is 10 inches in diameter. Now in forestry, we measure a tree's diameter at breast height, which is standardized at four and a half feet above the ground. And if the tree is on a slope, then this is four and a half feet above the ground on the uphill side of the tree. So this means that a tree must measure at least 10 inches in diameter at four and a half feet above the ground. Now there are several ways of going about measuring diameter at breast height, and we've included a great video that's been put together by the folks in UK Extension. However, for the purpose of this project, we don't necessarily need to know the actual DBH to determine if the tree is tappable. We can use a quicker method of deciding if it's large enough or not to tap. Do you remember that 31 inch section of rope that we had you require? Well, we're gonna use that to help us. So grab that 31 inch length of rope and we'll show you how you can use it to determine if a tree is large enough to tap. So now that you've identified some maple trees, it's time to see if they're big enough to be tapped. To be tapped for syrup production, maple trees have to be at least 10 inches in diameter. Now in forestry, we take diameters at a standardized height above the ground, and that height is four and a half feet. This is referred to as taking diameter at breast height because four and a half feet is approximately chest height on most humans. So taking diameters at breast height can be uh, a fairly daunting task if you've never done it before. Um, but luckily for us, we don't actually have to know or take the actual diameter. Um, we can cheat a little bit. So if you'll recall, um, you had to compile in your list of uh, supplies a 31 inch piece of rope, okay? And this is going to be used to determine if trees are gonna be large enough to tap. If you remember from your high school math days, circumference, which is um, the length around a circle, is related to diameter, okay? And the equation is circumference equals 3.1 times the diameter. Now in this case, the diameter that we're interested in is 10 inches. Okay, so if we plug that into the formula, circumference equals 3.1 times 10 inches, that gives us 31 inch circumference for a 10 inch tree. Meaning that the distance around the tree 
at breast height for a 10 inch tree is 31 inches. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, we have a 31 inch piece of rope and our test is going to be this. If I wrap my rope around the tree at breast height and the two ends of the rope do not meet or do not overlap, then that tree is large enough to be tapped. That tree is over 10 inches in diameter at breast height, okay? So again, how did I do that? I simply found where four and a half feet above the ground is. This is breast height. I'm going to take my 31 inch piece of rope, wrap it around the tree horizontally at breast height. And again, it, my test is if the two ends of the rope meet or they overlap, the tree is not large enough. But for example, in this case, the two ends do not meet. There's some daylight or a gap in between the two ends. Therefore, this means that this tree is large enough to be tapped, okay? And uh, just as a check, I did measure the diameter on this tree and it's approximately 12 and a half inches. So um, our rule does check out. Now let's look at an example where um, a tree would not be large enough to be tapped. In our last example, we saw a tree that was large enough to be tapped. We had a 12 and a half inch sugar maple. And when we wrapped our rope around the tree, the two ends of our rope did not meet. Therefore, that indicated to us that that tree was large enough to be tapped. What about an example though of a tree that's not large enough to be tapped? So I've identified a prospective tap tree. For our reference, I have measured and flagged breast height, four and a half feet above the ground. I have my 31 inch piece of rope and I'm going to apply my test. I wrap the rope horizontally around the tree at breast height and already we see that the two ends of our rope overlap one another. And that clearly indicates to us that this tree is not large enough to be tapped and that we should continue our search for larger tappable trees. So that video provided us with a quick way of identifying whether a tree was large enough or not to be tapped. So now a brief word on using multiple taps in one tree. So you may have heard or read on the internet that you can place multiple taps in one tree. And this is true. Depending on the size of the tree, multiple taps can be used and we have inserted the generally recognized guidelines for the number of taps that can be used based upon diameter at breast height. However, for this study, we are going to recommend that if possible, you place only one tap per tree. This is recommended for quite a few reasons. First, record keeping with the data will be much easier for you and much easier for us if we use only one tap per tree. We are interested in looking at the tap level and the tree level data and keeping these two things separate are easiest when there is only one tap per tree. Not to mention, this will be much easier on you when it's 30 degrees outside and you're collecting sap and trying to take measurements. Also, one tap per tree helps to hedge your bets a little bit. For example, if you had a tree tap in a tree that was 30 inches diameter at breast height, according to the tapping guidelines, you could place three taps in this tree. However, we can only see what's on the outside of the tree. And assuming the outside of the tree looked fine, we tapped it. But if there was some type of internal defect like heart rot, that would drastically inhibit sap flow in the wood. So at this point, you've lost production in a third of your taps. So using 10 trees just increases your odds of collecting a good amount of sap. All right. So let's say that you've identified a maple and that it's large enough to be tapped. What's next? So now begins the fun part 
of actually assembling the collection system. So the first thing you want to do is you want to tie a piece of flagging around the tree. This just helps us visualize and see the trees easier in the woods when we go back for sap collection. Also, on the, the flagging, you will want to write the tree number of this particular tree. And it's a good idea to write that number several places on the flagging around the tree. For tree numbers, we will use sequential numbers from one to 10. So for example, if I have tapped three trees already, those trees should have been trees numbers one, two, and three. And the next tree that I tap should be tree number four. This numbering process is very important because it's what helps us to track individual sap volume production for each tree. So you will record this tree number each time you take a measurement of the sap from this particular tree's bucket. So after you flag the tree, it's time to set the bucket. Find a good sturdy location near the base of the tree to place the bucket. You'll want to take the time to ensure the bucket is in a good location because all of your work will be for nothing if your bucket of sap tips over. If your woods are relatively flat, this isn't much of an issue, but if your forest is on a large slope, then you'll have to take these extra precautions. Typically on a slope, the bucket will be placed on the uphill side of the tree, as you can often wedge the bucket in between the slope and some uh, tree roots that may be sticking out of the ground. You can use the heel of your boot to remove some of the soil if necessary or add rocks under the bucket to level it up. One thing to keep in mind when you're setting the bucket is the location of the tap hole. Typically the south face of the tree is going to receive the most sunlight which will cause it to warm up sooner and result in greater sap volume. So many people like to tap the south face of the tree if possible. Also, if you are unable to avoid tapping a tree with defects, you'll want to avoid drilling the tap hole in those decaying areas. So placing the bucket away from these areas is essential. One final thought. Remember that you've drilled the hole for your tubing in the top edge of the bucket. So because of this, make sure you put that hole on the uphill side of the bucket. If you put the hole on the downhill side, because that bucket is on a slope, the sap will tend to have a higher level on the downhill side. And as that bucket fills with sap, eventually the level of the sap will reach that hole and you'll begin losing sap. So do yourself a favor and put the bucket hole facing uphill. So now that we've placed our bucket, is it time to drill the tap hole yet? Well, almost. So recall that we are working with fixed lengths of tubing. Okay? Your pre-assembled drops have a tap that is pre-assembled to a 36 or so length of tubing. So we have to plan ahead a little bit. After you've placed your bucket, insert the free end of the tubing into the bucket about three inches or so, and hold the tap up on the tree to see the maximum height up the tree that the tap can be placed. It doesn't matter really where on the trunk the tap hole is drilled, but remember that we're working with gravity, and it's gravity that's pulling sap down out of the tap through the tubing and into the bucket. So I would hold the tap up on the tree as far as possible. After finding a good spot for the tap hole, mark it in some way so that you know where approximately to drill your tap hole. And then, drum roll, drill the tap hole. So a couple of things to note when you're drilling the tap hole. Make sure that you drill the tap hole at a slight upward angle. Something on the order of 10 to 15 degrees will do. 
This ensures that sap can flow readily out of the tap hole. You will also want to drill about two inches deep. To make sure you only drill to this depth, you can measure two inches down from the tip of your drill bit and wrap a piece of tape around the bit at this length. And this is the example that we have on the screen. I've measured down two inches from the tip of the drill bit and I've wrapped a piece of electrical tape around the bit. And so when we drill the tap hole, we will drill into the tree until we reach the tip of this tape and then we'll stop and back the drill out. Other thoughts, make sure you drill straight in and out of the tree. Not only do you run the risk of breaking your bit if you don't, but oblong holes will result in a poor seal between your tap hole and the tap, which will result in loss of sap around the tap. Lastly, you'll want to remove any wood chips left in the tap hole. A clean tap hole ensures clean collection of sap. Note too, the wood chips coming out of the tap hole should be clean and white. If chips are dark or stained, this is an indication of decay or rot. So you should rotate around the tree and drill a new tap hole. So with the tap hole drilled, we can now tap in our spout. Insert the end of the spout into the tap hole and tap lightly on it with your mallet. Remember, this is tapping. So small, gentle strikes with your mallet are most effective. As you're tapping, you will hear the change in the pitch of the tap when the tap becomes firmly seated. When you hear this change in pitch, stop tapping. Do not overdrive these taps as this runs the risk of splitting the tree at the tap hole which will again cause loss of sap and damage to the tree. Well, that's all the hard part. Now just finish the setup. Ensure the end of the tubing is inserted into the hole in the bucket. Place the lid on your bucket. If the bucket is on a slope and you're worried about stability, you can place a large stone on the lid to help aid sturdiness. Then at this point, it's just a waiting game. Keep an eye on the weather as you likely won't have to wait long. If you're lucky, the tree may even be running when you tap and you'll be rewarded with your first sight of sap dripping from that freshly drilled tap hole. So now that you've installed all your collection systems, you are ready to transition into the checking, recording data and emptying bucket stage. Recall that runs vary with temperature, so monitoring the temperature is crucial. During run periods, a five gallon bucket can fill with sap in as little as one to two days. So developing a habit of checking and emptying collection buckets every couple of days is crucial. During periods when it's relatively cold or consistently above freezing, checking every three to five days is still a good idea. So each time you go to check your buckets, you will want to record some basic measurements on the data sheets that we've provided. We have provided each participant with the same type of bucket from the same manufacturer. Therefore, each bucket has the same dimensions which we have pre-measured. So by knowing these bucket dimensions, we can use geometry to calculate sap volume given only measures of sap height in the bucket. So you will provide us with sap height measurements that will enable us to calculate sap volume. As an aside, if you were not provided with a kit and you wish to participate in the study and purchase materials yourself, you must buy the five gallon buckets that we used in this study. Okay, if you use a different five gallon bucket, then the measurements that you give us won't allow us to calculate the correct volumes. 
So using the buckets that we used are mandatory for participation in the study. So how are we going to measure sap height? Well, uh, there are some intricacies to this, but you were provided a tape measure. And so you will use that tape measure to record the sap heights. So for measuring and recording sap heights, we will be using the metric scale on the tape measure. The tape measures that you were provided have both an English side, which is the top side in inches, and a metric side, which is the bottom scale in centimeters. We'll be using that bottom metric scale in centimeters. So just to refresh everyone's memory on the metric scale, when you're reading this tape measure, the large numbers represent whole centimeters and the, and the small ticks in between the whole numbers are one-tenth or 0.1 centimeters. Okay, so as an example of reading this tape measure, we have this red arrow that is pointing to a particular tick. How would we take that measurement? Well, we count over the number of whole ticks, that gets us to six, and then we count the small ticks as each one of 0.1. So I've got 6.1234. And so this particular tick corresponds to 6.4 centimeters from the tip, okay? So that's how we read the metric side of the tape. So it might be tempting for you to use the English side because that's what we use in the US and that's what's used typically in construction. Um, but for this, again, because of the calculations that we have to make, um, please provide this to us in centimeters. It has to be in centimeters. If it's not in centimeters, then our measurements and our calculations of SAP volume will be wrong, all right? So now that we know how to use the metric tape measure, let's talk about how we measure SAP height. The next video segment will show us how to use the tape measure to measure SAP height in the bucket. Okay, so let's discuss how you measure SAP height in each bucket. So you've been provided a tape measure. And recall that anytime we take a measurement, we're going to use the metric side of the tape measure. Okay, that's this bottom scale. Okay, so how is the setup of this going to work? Okay, so I'm going to extend my tape measure. I'm going to hold the tape measure in my left hand, and I'm going to firmly place my left index finger on the tape. Okay, this left index finger should always stay on the tape whenever you're taking a measurement. Okay, so then now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this top of this left index finger, I'm going to take the top of this left index finger and place it on the top rim of the bucket. Okay, your left index finger should always be on the top rim of the bucket. Okay, so after I've placed my left index finger on the top of the bucket, I'm going to ensure that the tape is lined up straight up and down in the bucket and that tape is along the sidewall of the bucket. Okay, the tape should always stay along the sidewall of the bucket. All right, so then now I'm going to take my other hand and I'm going to slide the tape up and down until the tip of the tape measure just touches the level of the sap. Okay, and so you, you may have to play with this a little bit until you get it just right, but we just want it to barely touch it. And at that point, once it's barely touched, I'm going to clamp both hands down on the tape measure, and I'm going to lift it, okay? This is very important. You want to make sure that when you lift it, you don't slide the tape measure at all. It needs to remain fixed. And so at that point, 
I'm going to read the measurement on the metric scale that's here at the bottom at the tip of the fingernail of my left index finger. Okay, that's why it's important for that left index finger to remain fixed because that's where we're going to read the tape. Okay, so in this case it would be 18.3 if you can see that. Okay, so let's walk through that again. I'm going to take my tape measure in my left hand, extend it, clamp down with my left index finger, place the top of my left index finger on the upper rim of the bucket, lay the tape measure straight up and down in the bucket along the side wall of the bucket. I'm going to take my other hand, slide that tape measure down until it's just touching the surface of the sap. Then I'm going to lift it and I'm going to read the measurement at my left index finger. And again, that's at about 18.3. So that video shows us the overall procedure of using the tape measure to measure sap height in the bucket. So now that we know how to measure sap height, let's talk about recording the data. So we've provided to you data sheets, and let's have a look at that. So on each data sheet, uh, there is a line for your name. Please do fill out your name on each of the data sheets. That'll just help us with record keeping. And the data sheets contain four columns for line entries. Okay, so each time that you go to measure and check your SAT buckets, for each bucket, you will record one row entry. Okay, so for example, if I checked tree number one on January the 20th, I would fill in the date as one slash 20 and the tree number would be one. So you also have these high and low measurement columns. So what are those? So those have to deal with how the sap lays in the bucket when the bucket is on an incline. Okay, and so we'll, we've got a, a video that discusses um, how you will walk through three particular cases. There's only three. Um, and these cases are listed at the bottom of the data sheet also for your reference. All right, so now let's have a look at those three individual cases that I talked about. Okay, this will be um, the processes that you use to actually measure the sap height um, accurately so that we can estimate sap volume as accurately as possible. Okay, so when we first discussed how to measure sap height in a bucket, that bucket was sitting flat on level ground, okay? And so that means that the sap height was at the same level all the way around the bucket, okay? Now, in the field, when you go to check your buckets, uh, this is likely not to be the case. Unless you're working in some of the very flat areas of the state, um, your buckets are go going to be sitting on a slope, and so they'll have a little bit of tilt to it, okay? And so that's going to alter um, the level of sap height in the bucket, okay? And so because of that, um, we have a couple of different ways that we're going to have to take measurements, okay? So there's really three cases that you're gonna run across in the woods of how the buckets will be sitting and how you'll have to um, take measurements for these, okay? And so each measurement, um, will be different depending upon the case, okay? So <clears throat> case one is the bucket that you see currently in view, okay? So in this case, the level of the sap in the bucket will touch the walls of the bucket all the way around, okay? So meaning that the level of the sap does not touch the bottom of the bucket, okay? So we'll show that, that's case two, um, and you'll be able to contrast um, what you see currently with um, case two, and those differences will be readily apparent to you, okay? 
So let's talk about how you measure sap in case one. Okay, so because there's tilt in this bucket, you'll have to take two different measurements. Okay, so when you uh, walk up to the bucket and take the lid off, if, there, if it's sitting on a, uh, an incline, you'll be able to tell quickly that there's a high side of the sap and there's a low side of the sap. Okay, so the high side of the sap will be um, the side downhill of the slope and the high side will be on the side of the bucket where the level of the sap is closest to the rim of the bucket. Likewise, the low side of the sap will be the uphill side of the bucket and it will be um, the side where sap height is the furthest away from the rim of the bucket, okay? And so in this case, in case one, you will need to measure sap height on the high side and on the low side of the bucket, okay? So our overall process of measuring sap height is the same as we discussed before, but how we're going to measure it um, and the, the measurements that we are going to take are gonna be slightly different, okay? So let's talk about first how we measure the low side of the bucket, okay? So remember, I'm going to extend my tape going to place my left index finger on the tape and I'm going to place the left index finger on the top rim of the bucket. Now, keeping my tape on um, the side of the bucket, I'm going to visually look to see where that low side is. Okay, and then I'm going to take my right hand and extend it until that tape touches that lowest part of the sap, okay? So in this case, um, again, there is gonna be a little bit of margin for error, and that's fine. Um, but you can, you know, kind of slide it around a little bit and see, you know, where that low side is. So I'm looking at this, the low side appears to be right there. I'm going to extend my tape down. Okay, that looks pretty good there. I'm going to clamp down, lift it up, and I'll take the measurement reading at the tip of my left index finger and that looks about like 21.8 okay so that was the low side reading and on your data sheet you would fill in 21.8 as the low measure for this particular bucket okay because it's measured on the low side of the bucket okay conversely I need a high side measurement okay I'm going to do the same exact thing I'm going to look and see visually where the high point is of the sap. Again, that's going to be the point um, where the distance between the top of the bucket and the top of the sap is the smallest. Okay, I'm going to uh, visually estimate that about right there. Left index finger on the side of the tape on the top of the bucket. Extend down till it just touches the top of the sap. Clamp down lift it, and my measurement looks about like 14.8. Okay, and so at that point, 14.8 would be my high side measurement that I would record on my data sheet. Okay, so let's talk about case two. Recall with case one, case one was the case you're most likely to run across in the woods. And that's the scenario where the top level of the sap touches the side walls of the bucket all the way around the bucket along the top level of the sap. But there's a fairly common case that you're also gonna run across too. Okay, and so this case is going to occur toward the beginning or toward um, the end of a run or potentially um, depending on um, how often you check your buckets this case might pop up also. And this is the case where the top level of the sap does not intersect the side walls of the bucket all the way around. Okay and so that's the case that you see in the frame currently. Okay so on the high side of the bucket, okay that's the side pointing downhill, we see that the top level of the sap touches the sidewall of the bucket 
But on the low side, we see that the level of the sap touches the bottom of the bucket. Okay, so in this case, because the, the top level of the sap does not um, touch the sidewall of the bucket on the low side, we can't take a low side measurement for this. Okay, that doesn't work. So we have to improvise a little bit. Okay, so how are we going to improvise to take this? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, really the same method of um, measuring sap height that we talked about when I first showed you how to measure sap height. Okay, we are going to level the bucket and take a single measurement. Okay, and so by leveling the bucket, we can, that sap height will be the same all the way around the bucket. And we'll only need it, again in that case, to take just one measurement. Okay, so how are we going to level the bucket in the field? The easiest way to do this is to lift the bucket by the handle. Okay, and again in this case, this is where having a helper um, will make this process easier. Okay, so by leveling the bucket, and I'm going to cheat a little bit and just place it on the level floor. In this case, by leveling the bucket, we're making the sap height the same all the way around. Okay, and so in this case, I'm just going to take my single height measurement the same way that I do the other ways, my single sap height measurement, 33 is what I've gotten. So in this case, my single sap height measurement is 33 centimeters. And so I would record 33 as the high side measurement on my data sheet. And for the low side measurement, I would put just a dash, okay? So after we level it, we take a single sap height measurement in my case, that was 33. I would record 33 in my high side column for that particular entry. And then I would put a dash in the low side column. And that will indicate to us the particular case. Okay, so the final case is the easiest case. Okay, so that's the case where the bucket is relatively empty. Okay, or it could be completely empty. So what you see currently in the frame is a relatively empty bucket with just a small amount of sap gathering on the high side. Okay, so in this case, um, we might walk up to this and say, okay, well this could be a case two example. I need to lift up the bucket by the handle and take a measurement. But if we were to lift this bucket by the handle and level it, we would see that because there's so little sap in the bucket that the level of the sap will not um, reach up the sidewalls of the bucket all the way around. Okay, so in this case we can't get a single height measurement. Okay, so what you can do in this case is uh, you can just record empty, the word empty, in the high and low measurement columns. And that will indicate to us that, there, that that bucket was either empty or there was just a minuscule amount of sap in the bucket so that you were not able to take a measurement. All right, so that video shows us the general process and the details of how to measure and record data for this project. Okay, so I know there were a lot of intricacies there, um, but please go back and watch it. Um, try to familiarize yourself and become used to taking these measurements. I know that we are, haven't even started um, tapping trees yet for this project, but and it, it seems a little strange to be talking about the end of the season, but we're taking the whole chronology of the project um, in this presentation. So um, you've been tapping, you've tapped your trees, you've been collecting sap for a while. How do you know when to stop collecting sap? How do we know when the maple season is over? And there is an end to the maple season. 
So maple season will end when trees flower out. Okay, this flowering is typically referred to as bud break. Okay, so the buds of the trees will begin to swell and then eventually will burst, revealing the flowers. And it's at that point that maple season um, is considered over. Okay, so <clears throat> red maples will tend to flower sooner than sugar maples. So this means that the end of the season is also weather dependent. During years with warmer winters, red maple bud break can occur as early as late February. But typically this occurs in early March. Sugar maples will flower late March to April. So why does bud break indicate the end of the season though? Bud break indicates the beginning of the new growing season. Therefore, the tree is beginning to switch gears and prepare for reproduction, growing new leaves, etc. So there's a lot of changes going on in the chemistry of the sap, and most of these changes are highly undesirable from a food standpoint. The sap will sometimes turn yellow, um, it will begin to smell, so this is an in excellent indicator that the season is over. So hopefully by the end of the season, you've had a few good runs and you've been able to make a few batches of syrup to enjoy. So to conclude the season, you will finalize your data sheets and send those back to us in the postage paid and addressed envelope that we provided. You'll need to pull your taps from the trees and collect your buckets. Taps can't be hand pulled, so you'll need some type of pry bar, as was discussed in uh, the inventory video. But when you're pulling your taps, um, ensure that you keep the flagging on the tree. Okay, that flagging is going to stay up until the study is over. All right, so the next thing you'll need to do at the end of the season is you'll need to sanitize your buckets and your drops. Drops can be soaked in soap and water and scrubbed a little bit on the outside to remove any excess dirt. Um, then they will need to be soaked in a bleach solution to kill microbes. Buckets can also be washed with soap and water and then dipped in a bleach solution. The insides of the buckets and the drops should be rinsed very well with water and then hung up to dry completely afterwards. Once everything is dried out, um, you can curl the drops into a bucket and place the lid on the bucket. This will um, ensure that um, no rodents or anything is chews holes in the tubing. All right, so then uh, lastly, um, we recommend that you don't use these buckets for um, anything else, any other purpose uh, besides maple sap collection. Um, but if you have to, then please use, only, use them only for food grade types of things. Um, don't put motor, motor oil or anything in them um, as that'll compromise the, the uh, ability to use them to uh, produce foodstuffs in. So what's going to happen after the end of the season? Well, at the end of the season, you will hopefully feel very accomplished and will have produced some batches of syrup. So in the summer of 2021, myself and a group of researchers from the UK Maple Research Team will come and visit your property and um, you will help us to collect um, some various other pieces of data that we'll need for this project, okay? Um, you will show us your tap trees. We'll take some various measurements of um, your tap trees. This will entail taking diameter of breast height, height um, of the tree 
also will record metrics of how large the crown is, how wide the crown is, calculate crown volume. Um, all of these metrics are important for um, estimating sap production from a tree. We'll also take landscape metrics. We'll look at where your trees are um, on the landscape. Okay, are they located at the top of the hill versus are they located in a stream bottom? Okay. During this point, we will also install temperature loggers. Again, recall back that SAP is a temperature and weather driven um, commodity. So knowing what the temperature patterns are um, that correspond to SAP production for your trees will greatly help to us to inform um, the management practices, especially um, it'll be useful for data collection in the following season. Okay, um, if you have any questions that might be burning um, at that point, you can ask us, we'll be at your disposal um, for the time that we're there. Um, so please, you know, um, ask us anything that you might, might think of um, during that time. Or, you know, you don't have to wait till then. If you have questions, we want you to feel free to reach out to us. Um, that's why we're here. All right, and then finally, we'll drop off to you um, a new envelope and new data sheets that you'll use in the following season. All right, so the last thing for this presentation, and I thank you um, for making it this far. I know there's been a lot of information and some of it's been quite tedious, but again, it's all important. Um, and, you know, once again, let me thank you for being part of this study and bearing um, all the tedium. So the last thing are um, some tips for successful sap collection. So when you're selecting your trees, it would be best to find trees that are near pre-existing roads or trail systems that can prevent, per, excuse me, permit vehicle access. Okay, so a five gallon bucket full of sap weighs about 40 pounds. So you won't want to carry many of those buckets full of sap over a great distance. Okay, that's just going to kill your interest and your enthusiasm uh, in this project. So along these same lines, it would be prudent for you to acquire a tank of some type that you can mount in the bed of a side-by-side -side or in a trailer pulled by an ATV or in the bed of a pickup truck. And this tank will be used to um, collect and hold the sap that you empty from your buckets. Okay, so, so you will mount this in the back of your pickup truck, let's say. You'll drive to your tree that's tapped right on the side of the road. You will jump out, take the SAP measurements. After you do that and record the data, you'll empty your collection bucket into that tank in the back of your truck, replace the collection bucket, and then jump back in the truck and go to the next one, okay? Again, that is simple, and, but it's efficient, and it will keep morale and interest and enthusiasm high than having to um, carry 40 pounds worth of sap across the landscape. All right, so the next thing is um, getting an eye for what good sap looks like. Okay, so good sap is clear, it's not cloudy, it is clear and it's odorless. Okay, so the first run of the year will tend to be yellow it, sometimes, okay? It doesn't happen in every tree, but it happens in, you know, a fair few of them. Out of your 10 trees, you'll probably have one that d displays yellow sap in the first run, okay? So if you, if you ever get yellow or discolored sap, um, then that has, um, chemicals in it that are most likely going to 
um, not be good for syrup production. Okay, so we generally you can, I mean you can do what you want with it, but typically most people will discard that sap. Okay. <clears throat> Likewise, at the end of the season in February March, if you get sap that is yellow, or even if you get sap that is clear but it has a strong odor, then that indicates that there is something going on with the biological processes in the tree. It's beginning to switch gears into the growing season. So at that point, that's an indication for the end of the season. And then lastly, again, if you ever get cloudy sap, um, if, you, if there's a long period in between when you check your buckets, then that sap, as it sits there, the microbes in the sap will begin to work and that sap will tend to become cloudy, okay? Um, it may develop what we call microbial floaters. You may get some bacterial colonies or something like that. Um, and as microbial activity increases, um, there will be a buildup um, in odor as well. Okay, so if you ever pull the lid off your sap bucket and that sap's cloudy or you get a, a really strong odor, then that's an indication that that sap has gone bad. And um, you will still want to take the measurements on that, okay? So, so that's, that's important. You should always, regardless of what the sap looks like, you should always take a measurement of the sap, okay? What you do with the sap afterwards is up to you, okay? Um, but certainly if that sap is cloudy or if there's a strong smell, then you should most likely discard it. Right, and the last thing is that um, to keep your sap in good shape, you should refrigerate it if possible. Keep it below about 40 degrees. Okay, so if it's cold outside, um, this is generally not a problem, um, but um, if you're getting later in the season and you're getting some warmer days, then you'll want to try to keep the sap refrigerated if possible before boiling. Okay, sap can set out for a day or two um, above 40 degrees, but no more um, than a day or two. At that point, then you're gonna start um, developing byproducts in that sap from microbial activity, and that's not good. All right, and that's the end. So we thoroughly hope that you enjoyed this tutorial video and you found it helpful and we hope that it was clear and easy to understand. So if you have any questions along the way about anything related to the study, how to tap the trees, how to collect the data, then please reach out directly to me, Zach Hackworth, and I've provided my email there. Once again, if email is not the best for you, um, st we'll start out with an email, and then if we need to, we can uh, discuss on the phone or on a Zoom meeting or whatever works for you um, to try to get the questions answered. Okay, if you have questions relating to um, our grant, or if you have questions relating to um, taking the sap and producing syrup um, from it, or anything um, beyond sap collection, then you can reach out to um, the other members of our research team, um, folks in Extension, uh, Billy Thomas and Jacob Muller, and also to um, John Locke if you have questions regarding um, how sap uh, production is related to things like silviculture and forest management. All right, so once again, we uh, thank you for coming on board this project and we look forward to working with you and seeing you um, sometime next summer. So thanks again and good luck and happy mapling.